All right, I know some of you were not here two weeks ago, and I think I handed out the outline. Some of you were, and so we'll continue with that. And one thing I want to say, just by a brief introduction, there's a lot of things we can't explain in the world. We don't always understand the ways of God, the mind of God, what he does or what he allows, and including in some of the requests tonight. But uh, we know we live in a fallen world with sin, but when it comes to the Bible, I really want to, as much as possible, get it right. I hope that's your thought too. Now we certainly can have different interpretations, different denominations, but rightly dividing the word of truth, or another way to say it is cut the path straight. Hermeneutics, the, the science of interpreting the Bible correctly. And you know, the longer I live, the more I really want that to be the case. We have this book of his revealed word, so we really want to understand what it says. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. And if you weren't here, I'm going to try to for the sake of time, I will review the outline, but I don't want to uh, belabor it, so have your pen or pencil ready. And I'm going to read, and then we'll try to fill in the blanks. We pretty much got down to the bottom half of number of page one, but go back to Revelation 11. I do want to begin reading. I got my big black King James Bible, so follow along, all right? Revelation chapter 11. And there was given me a rod, a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship in it. But the court, which is outside the temple, leave out. Measure it not, for it is given unto the nations, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I said before, 40, 42 months, or a time, times, and a half a time, like Daniel said, or 1,260 days is all the same way of saying three and a half years. So if you have your outline and you weren't here, fill in. Under, and by the way, I've given you a nice little thing to remember at the top. We're talking in the chapter about a towering temple, two witnesses, a terrible tormentor, tongues and tribes, tremendous tremor, and seventh trumpet, all beginning with the letter T, all right? Under the towering temple right in, John is given a rod, or you could put a reed, like a staff. John is given a reed or a rod. Letter B. If I'm going too fast, just raise your hand, all right? John is told to measure the temple of God and the altar and those that worship in it. Letter C. Trodden down. The time of the Gentiles will end in, I just read it, 42 months during the last half of the Great Tribulation. Everybody caught up on that? Or if you missed anything, raise your hand, all right? By the way, I bring up the other viewpoints just for a moment, not belaboring it, but as I said, there are differences. For example, with the 1,260 days or 42 months, the historical view of Revelation, which is, all of these are past tense, but. The, to them, the measuring of the temple represents the determining of the true remnant church in the midst of the uh, papal, or papal, excuse me, or papal, excuse me, that's how you say it, the papal church during the time of the Reformation. When I say papal, I'm talking about the Holy Roman Empire, Catholicism, the Pope, and the archbishops, and the control that they had. So papal, that's what I mean when I say that. So for them, it's the true church is the Measuring of the temple represents the true church amidst the papal control before the Great Reformation. To them, the 1,260 days are actually 1,260 years, being the duration of the power of papal Rome. The two witnesses that we'll talk about to them represent, and I mentioned these groups before, the Waldenses, the Abigenses, and others that resisted the pope in the years before the Reformation, or the series of popes, if you will. Now, the preterist, that's the first century group, to them, the 1,260 days or 42 months is the period of the Jewish war and of Nero's persecution or both. And the two witnesses that we mentioned, and I'll mention again, are either historic prophetic witnesses against the unbelieving Jews prior to the downfall of Jerusalem or a representation of civil and religious authority in Israel. Now I'll talk about the futurist view. That's the view I'm teaching, but there's not even complete agreement among that group. Now the idealist is the other viewpoint 
The 1,260 days to them symbolize the entire church age. And the two witnesses are the church throughout the church age. Now, I said this before, the historical view, the, ideal, the idealistic view, and the preterist view are all past tense. They all see the book of Revelation as happened in the past. The futurist view is the only view that sees Revelation we're studying as future. Now again, there's hybrids, and I'm not gonna get into all that because I said when I started the book of Revelation, we wanna do the semi-level. The advanced level, which some of you would like, we go into more of the histories and some of these hybrids and all that, um, but we're just gonna stick, try to stick to an, that would be what I call maybe the, inter, we're at the intermediate level, that would be the advanced level. The expert level is for anybody that knows the original languages. And, can, and none of us here are in that category, <laughs> okay? So nobody's in the expert category as far as I'm concerned. But the futurist is the only view that sees it as future. And the other thing is the difference. The futurist is the dispensational view, all right? The reform view, which could be represented by any of those others, here's the main difference, and I've said this from the beginning. They do not see a place for the nation Israel in the program of God. Is everybody clear on that? The futurist view sees a program for Israel as a nation in the future. None of those other viewpoints do. They see them as either the church has replaced Israel, become the true Israel, spiritual Israel, whatever. All right, so that's the main difference. I, I, I wanna clarify that for you, all right? But I do wanna be fair and try to, as much as possible, represent them as well. Now, let's read, and by the way, I for, forgot to mention this from verses one and two. I'm trying to review quickly. There is a temple that in the tribulation, that's what John is seeing, there's going to be a temple and the Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to reinstate their sacrifices. I'm gonna have a whole other series just on that alone. So, and then he's gonna break that agreement with them in the middle of the seven years, all right? So there is a literal temple in the, in the tribulation period. There evident, there's, certain, there's gonna be a literal temple in the 1,000 year millennial kingdom. Whether it's the same one, it's probably destroyed and they'll have to rebuild it, right? So there's gonna be a temple in the millennial kingdom there's gonna be a temple in that seven year tribulation period, all right? And as we get to the end of this chapter, Lord willing, there's a temple right now in heaven. So there's a lot of temples. But one thing John is saying, and this is the main point of those two verses, all right? When he's measuring, all right? Those that are on the inside belong to God, that's believers. Those that are on the outside are unbelievers. And you'll see that at the end of the book of Revelation. That's the main point, all right? And that now, under, to elaborate letter C, the Gentiles will trod down Jerusalem for 42 months. That's the first half of the tribulation period, all right? Um, and some would say that even goes back to Nebuchadnezzar. From that time on, when he took the Jews into captivity, some would say, no, it begins at when Christ is. Whatever it is, if you go over to Jerusalem today, I know they're going back, but not all of them are believing on Christ. Is Jerusalem trodden down today? You better believe it, they're in the news all the time. They're always the emphasis. They're always under scrutiny and attack all the time. So that's going to be that way until we get into the future, all right? Now, letter D on your outline. When you see measurements, write that in, when you see measurements in the Bible, it means God is beginning to deal with the nation Israel, all right? Letter E, the temple of God is limited here to the nation Israel. And the point of the matter is, letter F, there's no temple given to the church. We're going to be in the New Jerusalem. We'll talk about what that means. Today, we are the temple, and I said before, this is the one point where the reform group and the dispensational group actually agree. Today, we are the temple, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We meet in a building but church, you are the church. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So that's number, uh, number one, and the church is a temple under letter F. Number two, believers are indwelt by who? Holy the Holy Spirit, all right? So I re elaborate, number three, believers are the temple, not a building. And you see those verses that cover that. There could be many more. Number four, God does count those who worship him. Uh, did I miss anything? I'll, number one, the church is a temple that's under F. 
So letter F, there's no temple given to the church. Number one under F, the church is a temple. Number two, believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Number three, re reiteration, believers are the temple, not a building. Number four, God does count those who worship Him. Because notice number one, He's given a rod, He's supposed to measure the temple of God and the altar. And notice He's actually to measure them that worship Him. Does that mean like, oh gee, I forgot one sheep. God's got to recount everything. No, i got to ask Siri. No. <laughs> God knows all. In other words, God, what he's saying is God is aware, and Pastor Corny made this very clear on Sunday, God is aware of those who take him seriously privately and corporately in worship. God's aware of that. He's aware of that now. He will be aware of it in the future. He's aware of people that make him number one in their lives, and that's the point. Now, G, I'm just going it's, to, it's there for you to read on your own. I'm just going to hit the highlights because I already talked about this. Number, number verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11, the burnt offering. You've got the, burnt, the altar of burnt offering. That's on the outside. All right? Since the, that's why he's not to count that. All right? But there is a great truth. The burnt offering ap actually represents, it's a picture of Christ, and it's a picture of the cross of Christ and what he did, which tells us, as I've already talked about before, the gospel is still going to be available and go out for people to believe even during this great time of crisis in the great tribulation. All right? And I, I could say so much about what Sean talked about, and I know some of it might have been a little deep on Sunday night, but praise it. And you saw how elaborate the process is, didn't you? To just get it into the native tongue and all those different groups. And man, it's a, it's a process, isn't it? To get that into the language of the people. And then even then there's changes. I, was, I marveled about that because I thought about how God allowed men to not determine what goes in this book to discover by the providence of God, the 66 books that we have. And I said before, to understand Revelation, you need to have a little bit of understanding of the other 65 books of the Bible that precede it. All right, so this is why number two under G, the altar is not to be measured, it's given to the nations. This is limited to the 42 months of the Great Tribulation. All right? So you have this towering temple, and there's actually many. All right? And in fact, Ezekiel gave a whole full, lengthy chapters about it. And as some of it was they were in captivity, and he was basically saying, when you guys go back to the land, this is how you're going to rebuild the temple. We'll talk about that in a moment. It was a smaller version of Solomon's temple, but Herod expanded it on it, and that's the temple you see in the time of Christ. But John is seeing a temple in the tribulation period. All right? So now we go to the two witnesses. They're germane. They're very important to this book and this chapter. Number three, I'm under Revelation 11. Here we go. Verse three. And I will give, it's understood, not written in, but I will give authority or power. I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 2,203 score days. That's the 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. And the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So now you have these two witnesses. And again, there's various views, and we're going to Explore it for a moment. I went over this before. Under number two, the two witnesses, they're identified without any identification. All right? And I, I want to say this about that. And by the way, last time, the other verses one and two, I mentioned some things in the book of Daniel about the Antichrist and elaborated on that, so we won't, we won't review that. But these, these, two, I, these two witnesses... And that, let me say this, we're going to explore possibly who they are, all right? But if their identity was essential to the understanding of this book, their identity would have been given. So, but who are they? The historical view says, well, they identify them as men like John Huss. He was a great reformer. There's a movie about his life. I've seen part of it. He's burned at the stake. And Pope Sylvester, they, that's the, they, others even of the historical group say, 
Well, no, it's Walt Denson or it's a number of witnesses and they can't even agree. Uh, the idealist says, no, the two witnesses, that's the Old Testament and it's the New Testament. These are the two witnesses, all right? So the preterists say, well, no, it goes back to Joshua and Zerubbabel, and I'm gonna go over that for a moment, but let me, remember I mentioned the one futurist that is mid-tribulational. What I mean by that is, he believes the church is actually gonna go halfway through the tribulation, and his main points are out of this chapter. And one of the things he says, now go back to verse four. He says, the reason this is the church, notice they are called the lampstand. Now go back to chapter one, all right, of Revelation. Let's be fair and let's look at it clearly. Go back to chapter one of Revelation, the last verse of Revelation one, all right, verse 20. Remember he talked about and he said, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So they're the messengers. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. So you see, he says, you see, the church has to go through the tribulation because they're called a the lampstand. But wait a minute, wait a minute. When God wants to let us know what the symbol means, he tells us, right? Yes, that's true with the church era, chapters one and two. And when you get to chapter four, there's no mention of the word church. It's not mentioned again until chapter 19. But there's another aspect of the lampstand I want you to see, which I think is the true picture. Go back in the Old Testament. It may take you a couple minutes to find it. The book of Zechariah. It's very close to the last book of the Bible, Malachi. All right, so let's go back. I'm keeping up with the outline, but go back to the book of Zechariah. All right? Zechariah, I'm not going to read the whole chapter like I did before. I'm just going to highlight something. All right, I read the whole chapter 3 of the book of Zechariah, very close to Malachi. All right? Zechariah. And by the way, study the book of Zechariah or get a commentary. Zechariah has so much to say about the book of Revelation. It's a key book to, it's got history in there, but it's also got future prophecy in there. Now, chapter three, he talks about Joshua the high priest. This is not Joshua that battled Jericho, that succeeded Moses. This is another one. He's a high priest, and he's clothed in filthy garments. I mean, it's dung. I mean, it's bad news. He smells, he pollutes everybody, and his friends are, friends are standing by probably going like that. He is symbolically in dirty before the, God, and the angel that's there says, take these dirty clothes off, him, put a clean garment on him, a clean turban, and he basically says to Joshua, get your act together, I'm paraphrasing, and you can represent my people if you walk in my ways, all right? Then he comes to chapter four, and, he, and we have another guy, Zerubbabel, that's mentioned. If you name your son that, okay. <laughs> of course, all the names that are out there today, nothing would surprise me, but anyway, Zerubbabel, he is the guy that God is going to lead back and rebuild the temple. Remember, it's, sma it's smothered. It's wiped out by Nebuchadnezzar. When they go back, they're gonna rebuild it, all right? And he's going to lead that charge in the group. But notice now what is said uh, in chapter four, verse two. And he said unto me, what seest thou? To Zechariah, and I said, I have looked, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, and a bowl upon it, et cetera, et cetera. Now go down to verse three and two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and one on the left, all right? So apparently he's talking about these two men. Now the preterist says, well, they refer to this, but they say, well, what, what Joshua represent is, represents is the, the priestly line of the, of the attribute of the church and Zerubbabel is the royal line, all right? Because we're called kings and priests today. So to them, it's the church. So all those other views, it's always the church. There's never a separate program for Israel. It's always in some way, those groups are past tense and they're always associated with the church. That's what I want you to get clear on that, the difference. But notice the last verse, verse 14. Here we are, notice verse 14. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. So is it a double prophecy, something to be with the past? And is this in fact, are these guys going to be the two witnesses that stand before the Lord of the earth? Hmm, let's think about that. All right, let's go back to Revelation. Now I'm going back to the outline, all right? So 
here, and but among the futurists, there's not even agreement. So is, is this symbolic of a group of people or like the church? Or is it symbolic of documents, like it's supposed to be the Old Testament, the New? Or are they specifically two individuals? As you read on it, to me, I don't see how you can read this and not see them as two individuals, two people with two human bodies. But we'll read on. Now, under your outline, letter D, under Roman numeral two, among futurists, of which I am, there's not complete agreement. Some see them as Enoch and Elijah. Why would that be? Somebody answered that last week. They didn't, they didn't die. They were just translated right on up. Here's something fascinating. Go to the book of Jude right next to Revelation. All right? Go to the book of Jude, and here's something I think connects us right in with Revelation. Now, in the book of Jude, it's only one chapter. All right? So have you found it? Right next to Here we go. In Jude, notice verse 9. Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and dared not to bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Man, you ought to do a word study in that verse, because Michael might be even more powerful than, than Satan. But what is the dispute about the body? I mean, didn't we read that God buried the body of Moses? But wait a minute. Hmm. Is, in fact, the argument going because maybe the enemy is trying to prevent Moses from coming back and being one of the witnesses? Who knows? And the other thing, I was thinking about this today. In my natural self, I'm terrified of the enemy because I know I'm no match for him. And if Michael, the archangel, can not even rebuke him himself but say, the Lord rebuke you, that's what we need to do. You know, but we are greater is he that is in me and you than he what that is in the world. All right? So uh, we need to remember that. But... That's a fascinating thought, but that's not the main thing I wanted to read. Then he talks about false, he talks about false teachers and deceivers, and he talks about Cain, but go to the end of Jude. I'm having trouble turning my page here, but uh, he talks about Cain. I'll get it in a moment. I don't use this as much. All right, here we are. Now notice verse 14. Verses 12 and 13 is talking about all the false prophets and deceivers. Notice verse 14. And Enoch, or Enoch, also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, talking about what these, the false prophets, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all and to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which the ungodly have committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then he talks about the description of them. Do you realize that Enoch is prophesying about the second coming of the Lord. That's right. And the 10,000s of saints, if we go up in the rapture, or even the dead in Christ, we're, the, we're that group. We're coming back as the army of the Lord. He's talking about the second coming. He's the earliest known prophet to prophesy about the second coming of Christ, to execute judgment. That's what he's talking about. All right, and it's a fascinating thought. When you think about it, there is a non-canonical book called the Book of Enoch, where this is, you know, Jude, does it mean that Jude thought that book was authoritative, but if it's the truth of God, he will reveal it. The truth of the matter is the Book of Enoch probably quoted from Jude. But this is fascinating, uh, that this godly Enoch is the earliest recorded revelation about the second coming of Christ. So some say, you see, go back to Revelation 11, some would say, because of that, he's going to be this witness. Because when you look at this chapter, the witnesses are going to be declaring judgment. They're going to be talking about the coming of Christ. And so it's got to be to some people, Enoch and Elijah, and particularly because they did not die, so they can come back. Others say, no, 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 you're wrong. It's got to be Moses and Elijah. And here's the reason why they say that. If you look at verse 6, who had power of God to shut off rain. Who was that? Elijah, right? And who had the power, and by the way, why, did, why was it because Ahab married wicked Queen Jezebel, and they wanted to bring in Ashtoreth and Baal, and they were the agricultural gods, so we got to, we got to give homage to them so our crops are good. God said, I can take care of that. We can just wipe drought out, and Elijah, you pray, and I'll bring it forth. And that's what happened, all right? But it, who had power, all on the other hand, to smite the earth with all kind of plagues under the power of God and to turn the river into blood. Who was that? Moses, right? 
So some say it's got to be, and by the way, who, who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. And I said, Peter recognized him. He never even met him, right? We'll be able to recognize our loved ones in heaven. Absolutely. But Peter never saw them. But they were up there. So some say, look, you're not looking at, the, you're not looking at it correctly. Look at the plagues. It's got to be Moses and Elijah. Under number three, it could be unknown witnesses. And that is, we don't know who they are yet. They could be human witnesses. And I think they're, they, they, I'm saying they are human witnesses from their description of them. Two is always the required number of witnesses. It wasn't a group. It was two people. That goes back to Deuteronomy, Matthew 18. Now, McGee says this, and it can, he's not dogmatic, but he's got good argument. He says one of them has to be Elijah because it was prophesied that Elijah would return. Now, I hope you didn't stray too far from Zechariah. Let's go back to Malachi. So I, some say it has to be Joshua and Zerubbabel because it says they're going to be the two, there's going to be two anointed witnesses on the earth. It's not named, but that's an interesting way to end that chapter, right? Now in Malachi, notice chapter 3, all right? Let's see if you can guess who this is. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall come suddenly to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. And behold, he, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who do you think that is? John the Baptist. That's exactly right. He will prepare the way for the Lord. Good, Martha. That's exactly right. But here's something interesting. That is quoted. It is that the first part of verse 1 is quoted about John the Baptist. So we know that's the case from Matthew 11:10. Mark chapter 1, verse 2, and Luke chapter 7, verse 27. But the next words, the Lord whom you seek, is nowhere quoted in the New Testament. And the reason is, read on verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. He shall sit like a refiner and purify or silver. He, sh silver. he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them like gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. How can you not see Israel there? But did he do that in his first coming? No, he came as a lamb, right? He, he was a sacrificial lamb. This is talking about when he comes back in judgment. But here's the point. Malachi, so long, like all of the other prophets, didn't see an interval between the first and the second coming. They just kind of saw them as one event. We don't get that distinction until the New Testament. So Malachi just viewed both advents of Christ as one. Because those verses, you only get the first part of verse 1 quoted in the New Testament not the rest of it. Malachi is talking about the second coming, all right? But it, he's also talking about John the Baptist. But because the rest of that is dealing with the future, some say John the Baptist has got to be one of those witnesses. Go over to Malachi 4. Now we come to another verse. Let me see if you can guess who this is in Malachi chapter 4. And again, behold, the day cometh and it will burn like an oven. I think he's talking ultimately about the future. But notice now verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, whom I commanded unto him in Horeb. But here's the key verse. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you who? Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So in Jesus, we won't read, I read that last time in Matthew, Jesus said, Elijah has come, referring to John the Baptist, but he says Elijah is coming. All right? So McGee says, for him, because the Lord talked about it, both using the Old and New Testament, for him, the two witnesses is Elijah and John the Baptist. I'm under E in your outline. It was predicted that John, that Elijah would return. So if you missed anything, number one, some see them as Enoch and Elijah. Jude, he was the first one to prophesy about the second coming of the Lord. Enoch was. And then Elijah, some say, no, look at the plagues. It's got to be Moses and Elijah. Letter E, it was predicted that Elijah would return. I just read that. Jesus affirmed that. 
Then letter F, the two olive trees and the two lampstands, all right? And so we looked at that being Joshua and Zerubbabel, whether it was only for that day or is it also for the future day? Hmm, all right? So number one under F, the presence of Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. For some, that's strong evidence as well as Moses. Number three on your second page outline, John the Baptist was the forerunner to Christ at his first coming. He was like Elijah. They wore sackcloth. They were out in the desert. They knew what it was to stand against the forces of darkness and stand alone for God. John the Baptist was the witness for the New Testament. Elijah was the witness for God in the Old Testament. But John the Baptist was not actually part of the church. He was called what? A friend a friend of the bridegroom. We are the bride. He was called the friend, you see. But because of the various prophecies, some see the two witnesses as John the Baptist and Elijah. Some say it would be less likely to be Enoch because he was a Gentile. I don't know that that's a major strong point, but the truth is, and this is the main deal, letter G, the significance is not the identity of the two witnesses, but the time in which they appear. This is key. I want to repeat that because this is the main point that I think is very important. It is the significance is not the identity of the two witnesses, but the time in which they appear. All right? The time would seem to be the first half of the tribulation, that they would testify the first three and a half years or 1,260 days, all right? So that's key. So the, I repeat, the significance is not the, the identity, but the time in which they appear. Under two, under G, they testify till the beast appears and then they are martyred. And I wanna repeat number three now, following along in your outline. Everything here is associated with the Old Testament. You've got the temple, You've got the altar, they're clothed in sackcloth, it's Old Testament garb. And then we talked about Zechariah, the two trees and the two lampstands, Joshua, B, and who was it? Zerubbabel, all right? Z-E-R-U-B-B-A-B-E-L. Letter C. Those two men, and any of these two men, but particularly Joshua and Zerubbabel, and by the way, he told Zerubbabel, look, it's not by your brains or your brawn or by might or power that you're going to bring about the temple, but by my Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament. He came upon men for power. Whether he indwelled everybody, probably not. That's probably for the church age. He's going to be present in the tribulation. He doesn't have to have the church here to do his work. His restraining ministry will be gone. And that's when all forces of darkness will have their heyday. In Revelation, but the Holy Spirit is going to, he's going to he's empower that 144,000 and those Gentiles to bring about revival. He will be working, you see. Now again, so I, that's my point under D, under letter G, number four. Whoever these men are, they were given great miraculous powers. They could bring fire down from heaven. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and some say that's got to be Elijah because he brought down fire on the sacrifices of Baal. John the Baptist was described as baptizing with fire. Number six, these witnesses have power, or you could put authority, either one. They're immortal. They're immune to danger. I mean, if you try to challenge them, you'll be put to death. Think about the things they're able to do that only Christ could do until their mission is complete. And listen for all of us. The same is true for you and me. God's not going to take us home until his mission for you is complete. Remember that. It's a great truth, isn't it? All right. So again, now we come to, so we go from the towering temple to the two witnesses to the terrible tormentor. And he is terrible. Verse 7. And they shall, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. How on earth could this beast, it's the Antichrist, how could he stand against these two witnesses when they had this great power? Amazing. Well, 
The Antichrist is the beast, so let me make sure we're caught up in the outline here. All right, so the terrible tormentor under number three, the Antichrist, this is already in there, is the beast. He's the man of sin that makes war with the witnesses. He overcomes them and kills them. Here's letter D. There is a temporary victory of evil over good, or hell over heaven. There is a temporary victory of evil over good. And sometimes we think that even today, don't we? God will let Satan loose during this period. And then their dead bodies let lie there in the street. All right, now let's read on. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. So they're not even given a decent burial. I mean, this is a vicious, cruel, barbaric people. But yet, to go back to the Assyrians, they impaled their people on the wall. I can name it's illustration after illustration. Thinking in, during World War II, Lenin and Stalin, they were dead. They were displayed in the streets of Moscow. Well, this is the idea here. And the Antichrist will take over the world. He will garner all the support for overthrowing these two witnesses and leave them dead. They're treated as dead animals. The city of Jerusalem was called Sodom by Isaiah. It's called Egypt because every fiber of the world has entered into it. This is where our Lord was crucified. And so, moving on to the outline. So let's go on to page three. I'm trying to move. There are some little bit of misprints, and I'll try to... So the Antichrist will take over the world and garner the word is all, not al. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's all. All right. So... I just went on, so now, now, we're coming to, from the towering temple, the two witnesses, the terrible tormentor, it's the beast, the Antichrist, and now the tribes and tongues. Notice verse 9. And they of the peoples and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not permit their dead bodies to be put in graves. I mean, even Pilate, and he, even Pilate, uh, allowed his friends to take down the body, right, and give it a decent, respectable burial. His burial, his, probably his conscience was seared tight, but not so with these two. You're not going to have any fabricated lie. Well, the, the disciples, they came and stole the body and then said, he's resurrected. No, they're going to lie out there in the street and the whole world will be able to see it. Are they all going to go there? No, but think about the sophistication we got today. You can watch, remember the Gulf War? We saw it in live time on TV. You can turn in on your watch, your iPhone, and see everything that's going on in the world. And if this is really in the future, can you imagine how sophisticated devices will be? In fact, look in the medical world. You can go inside the body today. I think they're going to have the cameras on the outside of them and be able to project in. We're going to make sure no central system is going to start up or any heartbeats. We want them out there. We're going to watch them. And to the world, these two witnesses were the terrible tormentors but the real tormentor is the beast. So notice now, verse 9, And they of the peoples and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and not permit their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. I call this anti-Christmas. This is the antichrist anti-Christmas. They're making merry. It's a merry anti-Christmas. They're giving gifts, man. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. These two witnesses that tormented us with all the things they could do, now they're dead. And they're going to celebrate, and the Antichrist is going to lead it in a godless and commercial uh, Christmas. A lot of it's that still, what, still that way today, but far different from when we celebrate Christmas, when Christ came to earth, a little baby in Bethlehem. But so let's follow along now on your outline. So this is a under B. This is a morbid, curi a morbid curiosity of a godless society. It's anti-Christmas. And perhaps letter A under number two, perhaps these two witnesses predicted the resurrection. That's why they didn't want them to be buried. The world will celebrate. They were glad these two are gone. Now C. Under Roman numeral four, tongues and tribes will observe this martyred Mary anti-Christmas, letter C. But now notice something. God's breath will enter into them right in. They are resurrected. Notice verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. That's the word for resurrection. And great fear fell upon them who saw them. 
And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, I go back to my mid-trib future guy. He says, the church, to him, the church is the, remember the 144,000, remember that? To him, it's not a literal number, but it's a, that Jewish messianic group. That's the one witness. And that innumerable company of Gentiles, that's the second witness. So for him, that's, it's still the church. Remember what Paul said, give no offense to the Jew, the Gentile, or what? The church of God. The church is not here. It's not mentioned in any of these chapters till the end. I, there's a point to that. But he says, no, the Jews and the Gentiles, that's the group, and they're the church, and they're going through, and then you get to verse 11, and when he says, come up here, that's when they're raptured. So to him, they are raptured here in the middle of the tribulation. But wait a minute. Let's go back to chapter 4. John's not going to leave us in confusion. And the, I used to teach something differently here, and I've changed my viewpoint, because I think John is going to be consistent. Notice chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that was like that of a trumpet, it's the voice that's like the trumpet, talking to me, which said, Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I used to teach that's the rapture. No, I don't believe that. Now, what I'm, you're not going to have two come up here, two raptures. When John, to me, when John is transported, it has already happened, because after these things, after what things? The church age. Revelation 1 and 2, those seven churches, and the, that's, that's gone. After that's gone, after these things, Greek meditata, what? John's transported up. The church is already there, you see. So there are, he's, the church is already there. So you're not going to have two come up here as representing two raptures, but I just want to be fair. The other guy says, no, the church goes halfway through. Now, the, the historical group says, what you have here with the two witnesses, you've got a long line of witnesses that these guys that stood against papal Rome, and they were burned at the stake, they were put in prison, they were killed, and the, so those are the witnesses, and then the resurrection of them represents the Great Reformation. Pastor Carney went over in wonderful detail with Sardis, remember that, the whole church age period. You can sell indulgences and pray people out of purgatory. All that false stuff and shenanigans that was going on, martyrs, that were people that stood against that, were killed. To them, that's the witnesses, and then that come up, that's the Reformation that will never be stopped. The preterist says, no, you got it wrong. What this is here, the one witness, or the two witnesses, is all the prophets of the Old Testament. And the, and the apostles that preached against the unbelieving Jews. And then the, the come up here, the resurrection, that's the birth of the church. And the church's message is going to go forth and not be stopped. And even among that group, some say, well, the one witness is all the prophets. And the second witness and the final witness is Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead and the birth of the church. All right? Those things are all true, but it's all past tense. As a futurist, what I believe... John is teaching us through God, is this is future. These are two witnesses in the future, not in the past. And they have a special resurrection, all right? In fact, I'm going to have, a, I meant to do this at the beginning. I'm going to have, I'm going to have you participate before I close out tonight. I'm going to have some of you stand up. You don't have to say anything. I'm just going to have you stand up and represent a group. So I want to get to that. I trust that we'll close out the chapter. But let's read on. So these are two, by the way, if you go back to the, the guy's view that this is the church and they're dead bodies, if that's the whole church, there's no way they could just be in Jerusalem. I mean, this would look, Jim Jones and David Koresh, that would look like a splinter, a speck. I mean, they would be scattered everywhere because there's a numberable company of them. So there's no way that even fits to me that it's this big, huge group. It's two bodies. It's two people. I don't know how John would, would, does not want us to be in confusion about that. To me, I don't know how you can read this and not see it as two human beings, whoever they are. We don't know. We can't be dogmatic. But to me, it's two human being witnesses that lie dead and God raises them up. All right? So the tongues and tribes rejoice, but that's not all. So I believe it's two witnesses and God brings them to heaven. It's not the church. They're already there. Now, verse 12, And I heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here, and they send it up to heaven in a cloud that is, that is associated with Christ. All right? So it's a foreshadowing. They are foreshadowing the second coming, which is very near. 
All right, so they are a picture of that. They prophesied about that, all right? So, and their enemies beheld them. And in the rapture, you don't, you don't hear that. It's just going to be in a moment, and then the world will try to explain it away. But in the second coming of Christ, the whole world's going to see it. When Jesus ascended up the first time, who saw it? The believers only, right? When he comes back the second time, his enemies are going to see it. And they're not going to, they're going to be, yeah, that will be a sad day for them. Now, verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake. So this is the tremendous tremor on your outline. The tremendous tremor is the great earthquake. And a tenth part of the city fell, and, the earth, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Apparently this probably uh, opened the light to some unbelieving Jews, and they believed. And there were some there that probably got saved. Under tremendous tremor, under A, verse 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So the woe, by the way, let me make sure I get everything here. Oh, number five, I missed number five under C. C is they were resurrected. Number five, the cloud of glory is associated with the ascension and the coming of Christ. Everybody see that? Under C. The coming of glory is associated with the ascension and the coming of Christ. They are foreshadowing what is soon to come when Christ comes back. So we go really to this is the end of the, this is the, end of the tribulation period or close to it. The tremendous tremor. The woe trumpets, letter A, under number five, Roman number five, relate to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And this great earthquake, we've already seen one-fourth of the population of the earth has been killed. Then one-third of the population of the earth, is, people are killed. Now you add another number, 7,000. Letter number three under B. The earthquake seems to be limited to Jerusalem. The earthquake seems to be limited to Jerusalem, just as it was when Christ died and then rose from the dead. Literally, under four, it reads 7,000 men that really that died with names, or names associated with them. In other words, these were prominent men and women that went along with the Antichrist, but their prominence will mean nothing in that day. The third woe is past. It comes quickly, shortly, though not immediately, and this ends the second woe. So now we come to the final point, the seventh trumpet. You've got the towering temple, and, and there's one that John measures. There's going to be several. And the, the tribulation one, the millennial one, there's one in heaven. We'll see quickly in a moment. you got the two witnesses. I don't see how you cannot read it and see it as two human beings. But I did declare all those other viewpoints. Whoever they are, they are from God. They have a purpose. The terrible tormentor is the Antichrist. He kills them, but God raises them up. You have the tremendous tremor that pictures what happened when Christ died? And I think it pictures what his two witnesses that died and went up just as Christ was resurrected. The seventh trumpet opens this up to the seven personalities that we'll learn about. Our Carney will uh, teach on Revelation chapter 12 and even verse chapter 13. Letter A, the great angel sounded. I'm reading verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom, it is singular, of this world is become of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I mean, whatever your style, if you like praise and worship, man, there will be praise and worship your best songs ever. If it's southern gospel or soul gospel, whatever, they'll sing it. If it's high church with the organ and get out, Handel's Messiah, boom, it's all going to be represented up there. And it's, it's represented now. They're praising God. And I hope we put it into practice too. Wonderful praise going on. And why are they praising? In the, verse 16, and the 20 and 4 elders, I believe it's the church, some say the 12 apostles, 12 tribes, but uh, whoever, we're not, they're not identified. To me, I think it's the church, who sat before God on their thrones, fell upon their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. Notice the names that are given to him. Who art and was and art to come. He's eternal. He's in control. He's reigning. He's in charge of the events that are going on. And let's stop there for a moment and go back to the outline. So on page 5, and uh, reading on, And the nations were angry that thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. I hope I didn't, I want to make sure I didn't miss something because I wanted to go over. 
yeah, I did miss something. I want to go back to page four. This is what Pastor Carney went over, but I wanted to review that. I know oh, I skipped the whole page, didn't I? All right, so under, that's what happens when you're using a lot of pages. Okay, so I'm on page four. I will move through it quickly. The, the verses 15 and 19, this is the parentheses, all right? So we're in the, this terrible tribulation, and then John shifts us to the future. It's a parentheses. We're at the end of the tribulation, then he shifts us to the eternity, to the opening of the temple in heaven. So you've got all this chaos and judgment. Why is this section here? I believe to encourage the believers that are on earth, those that are sealed. I believe that 144,000 and those Gentiles, they're sealed. They're going to make it all the way through the tribulation. They're going to be the ones repopulating the earth in their natural bodies. You see, all right? So that's very important. All right, so number two, so it, this is in the program of God. It takes us right to eternity. The mystery of God is unraveled. Here's the point, letter B. This, bring, this brings a sum, summary of events to the door of right in eternity. Eternity. We read, there are great voices in heaven with the angel. Great voices, unlike the silence in heaven, when the seventh seal was opened. Remember when the seventh seal, it was that silent period, the last measure of God's grace before all judgment falls upon the earth. So it brings us to the door of eternity. There were great voices in heaven, and the silence in heaven is when the seventh seal was opened. D, the participants are rejoicing in anticipation of the final termination of evil being close at hand. Not only evil itself, but what it brings, sorrow, injustice, disease, sadness, sorrow, death, it'll all be done. They're rejoicing. Jesus will reign forever and ever. Now I'm going to, I want to get, even if I take five extra minutes, spare me and we'll get through the chapter. I'm going to go down this quickly because Pastor Carney mentioned this and I'm basically just reviewing, but it's an important point. Follow along. It is the kingdom of Christ because the kingdoms belong to Satan. He offered them the Christ, right? So there's various views. Are we now under the minion of, of the prince of the power of the air? Are we not? All right. Some say that was restored. I'm under B, under three, when Christ, after he went to the cross and rose from the dead. Now here's the last week's lesson, or two, three weeks ago, actually. Remember, the angel claimed all creation belongs to God. God gave that deed to Adam. Adam forfeited that when he sinned and gave that deed over to Satan. Letter E, Satan's ownership is confirmed in Scripture. There's the verses. Remember the rule of ownership from Leviticus and even the story of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. To redeem means to buy back. We are in the slavery of sin. God purchased us. And it means to claim back what has been forfeited. Adam, Adam was forced to give that up. Only a kinsman could claim that back that had been forfeited. To redeem means to buy back. The redeemer would have to pay the price back plus more. Satan gained that because of sin, so a price greater than sin would have to be paid. Only a kinsman without sin, have to be human, divine, human, Jesus, only he could fulfill that. Only a sinless one, only Jesus could be the Redeemer. Remember Revelation 5, the seven seal book, is anybody worthy to open it? Is any man, any woman? No. Only Christ is worthy to open that book. He's the new Adam. Now, quickly, how do I reconcile the two? Here's what I say. I believe 1 John 3, 14, we have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So I believe for believers, we're no longer under the dominion of Satan. We're not. But he still holds power over the world of unbelievers. And you're going to see that directly in Revelation. Today, we're not under that dominion, and the church is not under. Now, we can place ourselves on it, but we don't need to be. The world is under that. So that's my reconciliation of it. God will ultimately reign over evil. Go on to page five. All right, I'm going to finish up. So the nations were angry. They're going to hold their fist at God in anger. Letter C, the carnal mind is against God. The nations are angry. Verse 18, I'm reading, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged 
that they, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them who destroy the earth. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant, and there were lightnings and voicings, thunderclaps, and an earthquake, and great hail. Give me five extra minutes, and I will be done. One point, I have this book, The Four Views of Revelation, and he tries to represent them well. I don't think he's a futurist, because that's the one group he kind of attacks at times. But he says this, reading these verses, virtually all futurists um, see the, tr the trumpet of the seventh angel as the heralding of the second coming of Christ to put down all opposition. I agree. And to take authority of all the nations to himself to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth. I agree. And he says, and it says he will reign forever and ever. That's the reign of Christ associated with the 1,000 years, all right? But here's what, here's what he says. Here's what I'm going to have you participate for a quick moment. One problem associated with this view, though, is in verse 18. Look at verse 18. You've got a resurrection of the dead and a judgment. Dispensationalism teaches that Christians are raised at the rapture prior to the tribulation, and that the wicked are raised at the end of the millennium. However, this passage seems to place the resurrection and judgment at the end of the tribulation. On dispensational assumptions, that is seven years too late to involve the church, and 1,000 years too early to be the wicked. How does one harmonize these thoughts? Well, he's missing that the judgment seat of Christ, that's for believers. I'm going to walk you through real quick so that you understand this. All right? So, I'm going to have you, I'm going to walk down. All right? So, let's have, let's pretend that this building represents the whole church age from the time of Christ on. Every, in other words, if you're the church, you are a believer. No matter what denomination you are, what ethnic group, or what part of the world, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a part of the universal church. Let's say the empty pews, it's always this side for some reason. <laughs> Let's say the empty pews represent the dead in Christ. Those are the ones that from time of Christ till, and even ones we've known, they're gone. They're, right, they're up in heaven with the Lord, but they're waiting for their new resurrected body. All right? Now, would you, would you stand up, Georgia? So Georgia's going to represent the rapture. All right? So if we're alive and he comes back, the dead in Christ, what? They rise first, right? And then we will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. That's number one resurrection. That's the first resurrection, all right? Now, we're moving down. We're going to pretend we're walking down seven years of tribulation, right? All right? Now, Randy, would you stand up? All right? So here's number two revelation, or resurrection, excuse me. So the second resurrection is in that seven-year period. There's going to be a sealed group that I believe is going to make it through, the 144,000 and the Gentiles. But there's going to be a lot of tribulation saints that die. In fact, most will because of the plagues and the Antichrist. They've died. So when you get to the end of the, of the seven years, the second resurrection is for the Old Testament believers and the tribulation saints that have died. The kingdom is for them. You see, the church is already in heaven. That represents George, right? Seven years of tribulation. Then you've got the second resurrection. That's for all those tribulation saints that have been killed, right? And the Old Testament saints, that's when they're raised. And they go into the kingdom. That's resurrection number two. All right? Now we're moving through 1,000 years, and you've got all those people. Remember, they're going to repopulate the earth in their natural bodies, right? You're going to have some people in their glorified bodies, some in their natural bodies. It's going to be a population explosion. 1,000 years. All right? Jose, would you stand up? So uh, this is only a symbol, Jose, but this is at the, 1, 000, the end of the 1,000 years. You've got the third resurrection. And that's for all the unbelieving dead from all time. All right? So you got resurrection one, rapture, and all the dead in Christ. Resurrection two, at the end of the tribulation, that's for the Old Testament believers and the tribulation saints that died. They're resurrected. The kingdom is for them. All right? You come 1,000 years, and a lot of people live long, but they die. So the unbelieving dead are raised. But Daniel also says all those people that lived in the 1,000 years and then they finally died, they're going to be resurrected here as well, unto life and the unbelieving to, to eternal death. All right? So you get it? Those are the, res and you have sometimes a special one, like those two witnesses. But those are the three resurrections. So everybody can sit down. I will close with that thought. All right? So or a couple thoughts, and we're done. So does everybody understand that? So those are basically, when you look at it, uh, that's, the, that's the issue here. You've got the first resurrection, and that's of the church 
prior to the tribulation. The second resurrection is for the Old Testament and tribulation saints. That's when Jesus comes back. That's his second coming. His second coming is when the Old Testament the saints, believers, and the tribulation saints that have died will be resurrected and go into the kingdom. The third resurrection is for all the unbelieving dead at the end of the 1,000 years, and also for those that lived in the millennium and died, and they're resurrected to go unto the Lord. All right. The final thought from the temple, and this is where Carney will take us into uh, the following week. So I'm on your, the end of your outline. Number five, the temple of God is open. And the church does not have a temple. We're the temple. There's no temple. There's a temple here, but that's in heaven. That's why right in Moses had the tabernacle built after the pattern in heaven. Moses had the tabernacle built after the pattern in heaven. Let her see, since the temple is open, God is dealing with Israel. There is a literal temple seemingly now in heaven, all right? So worship and access, it's not, our, it's not, 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 it's a misprint, are now open for Israel. The church has no temple. We are the temple, the prominence is for Israel. Finally, the covenant making and the covenant keeping God is evident. And I believe what he has said to Israel you heard this verse on our Sunday. It's the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So all those lightnings and thunders, that speaks of judgment to come, as we'll learn about in Revelation chapter 12. Thank you for allowing me to go six minutes over. Let's all stand, all right? And don't forget to go over and uh, take the tables down. Let's close out in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we've dealt in a very significant chapter. We see what goes on in the great tribulation, and then we are taken into eternity. And that's an encouragement. It will be for those in the future, but when we read your word, let it be an encouragement and source of support for us wherever we are tonight, particularly for the prayer requests that were mentioned and ones that are on our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.